بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته الحمد لله رب العالمين وبه نستعين والصلاة والسلام على شيب الأنبياء والمسلين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين هي سيكسنسي دكتور خالد بن محمد العطية Minister of State for Foreign Affairs of the State of Qatar Thank you sir for coming all the way to Malaysia and I hope that you will be coming here as often as you wish because you are our friend and we would like to welcome you. Yang mabahagia Tengku Zain Yang mabahagia Datukku Ja'afar Ku Sha'ari Director General of IDFR His Excellency Rashid Mirza of the Embassy of Qatar, Professor Dr. Muhammad Hashim Kamali, Chairman and CEO of IAIS Malaysia, Dr. Hassan Ibrahim Al Muhadi, Dr. Anas Al Takiri Al Takriti, my apologies. Ladies and gentlemen, first of all, I like to say that uh, I am very happy to be able to come to this event, not to be, not to deliver a speech, but uh, an opportunity to see so many of you, and especially when there are many friends along, and I hope that I'll have an opportunity to feel, say a few words to some of those that I have not yet met since for a long time. First of all, allow me to express my gratitude to the organizers of the forum for their kind invitation for me to deliver a dinner address. I wish to commend Yama Bagia Datuku Jaffa, Professor Dr. Muhammad Hashim Kamali, and Dr. Anas Al Takriti, as well as all the all their capable staff for for coming here and participate in our activity. I consider this forum which, ex which ex explored peace and security from an Islamic perspective to be a crucial effort towards awakening Muslims to the imperative of advancing Islam, Islamic peace building. This collaborative effort by IDFR, IAIS Malaysia, and the Cordoba Foundation with the participation of Malaysia's global movement for moderates and of the state of Qatar may point the way, may point the way to more effective promotion, promoting human well-being and ensuring genuine security within Muslim societies. In my signal, I wish to indicate that uh, the security within Muslim societies today is an issue that is very important to us and I feel that this is a very important subject and I was happy to know that uh, you did pay some attention to discuss on this topic. I have been asked to talk on a subject that uh, many of you are already familiar with. I would like to take uh, this opportunity to speak frankly and uh, hopefully forthrightly about issues that concern me a great deal, I must say. Nearly two years ago, when I was invited by IDFR and IAIS to speak at their forum on the title Peace and Security, Islamic Perspective, I expressed my unhappiness and anger, in a way, at the the most full situation many Islamic countries were facing and the failure of Muslims to rectify their weaknesses and shortcomings in order to improve the livelihood of, of their ummah. Tonight, uh, I must say that I am still uh, very concerned about the subject. What we see today is still trouble everywhere. Many of the Muslim countries suffering from conflicts, internal unrest, and wars that have caused death, displacement, 
and disaster to thousands of people. What is even worse is that Muslims are fighting one another, killing one another. What has happened to the Muslim world? People have been asking. And that is a reflection of our concern and our unhappiness and our sadness if we were look if we know what is happening in many of the brotherly countries, especially those countries which are now facing with so much problem. Ladies and gentlemen, I was in Bahrain last week attending the meeting of the Interaction Council, a grouping of former leaders who meet annually to discuss pressing global issues. This year, in its 31st annual plenary meeting, we deliberated on the present state of the world, the water energy nexus, bridging the religious divide and nuclear non-proliferation. I wish to share with you some of the key points made by His Excellency Dr. Abdul Salam Majali. He happens to be a good friend of mine. We have been friends for many years, actually. He was formerly the Prime Minister of Jordan. In his key, in his keynote speech, a pricing in the Arab world, the reality between the failure of politics and policies, that was the subject that uh, he discussed for us. After giving the historical background of the Israeli of the Israel Palestinian and how the formation of Israel has resulted in a fleeing of distrust between between rulers and people in the surrounding countries like Jordan, Syria, Egypt, and Lebanon, uh, Mr. Majali concluded that 20 years after Madrid Peace Conference, what we have is a small piece of peace. At the moment, Arabs and Israelis are not dreaming the same dreams. The failure to achieve peace in the Middle East is the major reason for Arabs and Islamic frustrations today. This is the failure of politics. Mr. Majali then continued. He, and he also cautioned us on a number of time bombs that need to be addressed by the Muslim countries. The second is the unemployment. Arabs, the, Arab, the young Arabs, young of the young population can create dynamic societies, particularly if they are well-trained and well-educated. That's a good point. The third is the inability of economies to achieve sustainable economic growth. Middle Eastern countries are among the highest spenders on arms and armaments in the world. Sadly, at the expense of resources that could, be, that could be allocated to real development on, on achieving real human security. The fourth is financial malpractices that play the pivotal role in frustrating, in frustrating the masses. The existing, of, the existing of these time bombs sub, sum up by Mr. Majali as the failure of policies. So the failure of policies and failure of politics to him and when he explained to us, and I did, I did agree with him in a way, uh, these are problems that we are facing today. Ladies and gentlemen, the trouble of what we what is today regarded as Arab Spring has been a sign of disaster to security. Arab countries are trying to bring peace among their nations, but the results have been very unacceptable. No efforts could be made to bring peace to these countries. Therefore, what is happening today is for me is a tragedy. And in some way, if I say this, please forgive me that uh, tragedy and shame. It seems to us none of the countries after, after the two years that I last spoke, 
are able to pacify efforts to bring about peace and establish a, a stable government. Numerous meetings, conferences and seminars have been convened and today we are having another conference, but have we brought peace? That is the question we always ask. It seems to be difficult, but why do we, why do we fail? Many conferences have been held, you know and I know. But the problem is that what do we do after having had the conference? How much efforts have been made to ensure that we can progressively, progressively make the effort in order to ensure that peace will return to the countries? Has the Ummah lost its collective will and conscience? These are questions asked. Or are its leaders too distracted by their own self-interest in private pursuit of wealth and power? These are questions that ordinary people always ask. God has given us Al-Quran. God has sent the Prophet to us to pacify, but it seems that we continue to fail. This certainly is very, very unfortunate on our part. I, having said so far, I like to divert a little bit, and I would like to just uh, introduce these two words that you may, whether you agree with me or not. But it seems to me that uh, now we are facing what I would call the Muslim dilemma. I was asking uh, Professor Hashim Kamali just now, I was asking him whether someone has already spoken on the subject of uh, Muslim dilemma, or whether books have been written on it. But he said that, no. And I did ask our young prince here whether this word has been used before. And uh, he too said that we haven't heard about it. Then if that is the case, is Muslim dilemma something that is not acceptable? Or is it something that we know, but we have not cared? We have not, took much, we have not given much attention to it. So this, is, this dilemma, if not addressed, then we will continue to see the problems emerging in many of the Muslim countries. We are not talking about the Muslim countries in the Middle East only. We are talking of countries, non-Muslim countries, but with very big population of Muslims. We, we know what is happening in Myanmar today. For example, we know what is happening in, Vietnam, in, uh, in Thailand. We know what is happening in southern the Philippines and uh, in many other countries. I think this is something that, uh, this is a situation that has been addressed and we must continue to address, we must continue to try and find, find what could be regarded as a solution to these problems. We have been making, we have been having a lot of conferences in many places, but, uh, but somehow you are not able to secure that peace that is so important to us. Ladies and gentlemen, as Muslims, we must, we must refresh our understanding of what our great religion and tradition teaches about peacemaking, peace building, and reconciliation. The governments of Muslim societies must awaken to the potential benefit and wisdom of heeding the guidance preserved in the valuable treasury of Islamic intellectual and ethical legacy. Islam is a religion that seeks peace and eternal security. The name Islam itself carries the meanings of both peace and security joined together just as it joins life in this world and then hereafter. Islam clearly teaches that equitable sharing and impartial justice are essential to ensure, to ensure security and peace. To me, there will be no true peace 
when there will be no true peace, when the people do not have any sense of security. And a nation that is not at peace with itself will almost never be at peace with its neighbors. It is therefore vital for us to focus on setting the, condition, the conditions for economic and social progress and transformation as poverty, hunger, and high unemployment rates and the sources of instability and threat to security. Open and above that, we are aware, certainly we are aware we are facing yet another problem. And this is the problem that will not be easily solved. That is water security, food security, energy security. We are seeing a situation that this situation is becoming more and more pressing upon us. But the question that we would like to ask, which is more important, is this the pattern of uh, lack of food? This food security is a problem, for example. This is something that you have to address. There are many of the problems today that need to be addressed. Of course, we have problems. We have political problems. We have economic problems. We have troubles among us. But we have to know that if we are to survive, we need food. Food security has to be ensured, for example. And there are other problems of nature that is today causing a lot of problems and unhappiness. Unless this is addressed, we will not be able to achieve what we need most of all, that our people must be able to live in peace. Inequalities are known to be an instigator of political and social instability, whether or not they result in open conflict. We must ensure continual, continual economic growth and development by creating productive and fulfilling jobs for the populace, especially the young people, increasing competitiveness with reliance on human capital development, providing efficient social infrastructure for all, ensuring that our economies, our economies are clean, green, and, and sustainable, and above all, closing income and wealth and wealth gaps. This was the reason why we started the World Islam Economic Forum, WIEF, an institution that I helped to build. And today I'm, I must say that I'm very happy that WIEF, World Islamic Economic Forum, is doing well and uh, has very strong support not only from Muslims, but also from non-Muslims. They have held this uh, forum in many places, and soon uh, the WIEF will be having its conference in London, and it will be the first WIEF in a non-Muslim country. In fact, this year we are going to have this very important uh, conference, and I hope that uh, as many people, as more and more, uh, Malaysians, not Malaysians, Muslims who are, who are interested on the, on the subjects that will be discussed and uh, they should be participating. I think this is very important. I have seen that uh, WIF today has been able to convey many of the ideas which are very important to us. I think you must continue to, to be together. You must continue to discuss in order that we can create whatever we are doing today, we have scored a lot of points, and more and more people are responding to what we are, uh, we to what we have been able to put it across to them, and uh, this is uh, to me a very important program that we have to continue to carry. Being a multilateral country, Malaysia has vast experience in attempting to reject ethnic and cultural chauvinism 
and steer towards a productive middle path or at least to offer an alternative way to handling discord and conflict. During my administration, we tried to promote the concept of Islam Hadari. And this is another of my favorite, or civilizational Islam as a way to reject narrow literalist interpretations. Islam Hadari embraces matters of faith, but also make it uh, obligatory to activate that faith is ways that improve society, such as through acquisition of knowledge, through comprehensive economic development, improving the quality of life, and protecting the rights of women and minorities. In short, Islam Hadari serves as the under, underpinnings of good governance, including justice and fairness for everyone in society. Islam Hadari posits 10 fundamentals, principle which Muslim countries must cultivate. These are faith and piety in Allah, the creator of all things. Two, just and trustworthy government. Three, a free and independent people. Four, vigorous pursuit and mastery of knowledge. Five, balance and comprehensive economic development. Six, good quality of life for the people. Seven, protecting good rights, protecting the rights of women and minority groups. Seven, cultural and moral integrity. Nine, safeguarding of natural resources and the environment. Ten, strong defense capabilities. I have always held this very important reminder that if we plan to do something, it is important that we undertake it. To say that these are the, these are the principles that we can accept, that, we can, that can help us, is not enough. But we must be ready to start working, working and implementing these very important principles. These principles, 10 principles, as far as uh, uh, that we can introduce here in Malaysia, I like to say that the non-Muslims, the non-Muslims have seen these principles as acceptable. They have no fear of that, uh, these principles. These are the principles that Muslims and non-Muslims can accept. And this in some way provides us with some, uh, some if, I, if I could say, stability. There is, no, there is no cases where, because of this, we start, we start to, uh, to challenge why these principles had been applied. Why, this is, why, are these Muslim, why are these for Muslims and they are not for non-Muslims? I have already told them that these principles are principles which are acceptable to both Muslims and non-Muslims. But uh, if we know that we are having a, our society is such, it's multiracial, then we could continue to ask, what is it that we can do to bring us together? We cannot tell them, you do whatever you want, this chaps to do whatever he wants, and us we will do whatever we want. We want to find some kind of a, of a very important uh, uh, um, principles that we all can hold on together, and when we implement it, we will know that this will be for all of us. It is not just entire. It is not limited to any particular particular groups in Malaysia. So. We have always been talking about oneness, oneness, Malaysia, Satu, one Malaysia. If you want to talk about that, we have to bring them together. We have to make them feel that this is what we can do together. And this is something that even Muslims and non-Muslims, whether they are Hindus, whether they are Christians, whether they are Buddhists, they are Muslims, all of us feel comfortable if these principles are applied to many of the policies that we are introducing today. Of course, uh, um, the latest, the latest, uh, the latest introduction or proposal uh, that has been uh, uh, made by our Prime Minister Dr. Muhammad Najib is the issue of wasatiyah. So wasatiyah 
certainly is not against uh, Islam Hadari. It's certainly not, because the two, the two are very much together. When Islam Hadari was introduced, the reference to Wasatiya was already there. And uh, I, I see that what we are going to do can bring us together in unity and working together for the, for the, pro, for the prosperity of Malaysia, our country. So um, these are some of the, uh, the issues that I like to, uh, to put, it, put it across to you. But uh, it is, I would like to say it again, that uh, if we want to have peace, in our Muslim country, we must continue to, to continue to work hard. You must continue to support. You must continue to help. This is very, very important. And any problems that we are facing, like what, is, what we know, which is the, uh, um, the conflict, the conflict uh, that we are facing today, and um, we have to address. We have to address. If we don't, then the problems will remain there, and I think this is not going to be in the good interest of our Muslim brother countries. So, ladies and gentlemen, I hope that um, uh, what I have said, especially this, that I want you to to go deeper into the Hashem. On the, I think it's important uh, that we we um, have deeper understanding. I think Muslim dilemma is, to me, is a problem. It's a problem everywhere. But if we think that this is a problem that we together can apply whatever principles, whatever policies, whatever ideas we can, I think they will help us. I think this is a very important uh, principle and this is something that we must all remember. This is something that will be good for us. And when you are going to have these discussions, I hope you will give me a chance to be sitting with you to listen what you are going to say and uh, if there's something that we can contribute, I think that will be very good. There will be no more Muslim dilemma in the future, but there will be a future of prosperity, a future of wealth, a future of success in many of the efforts that we can undertake. So thank you. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Selamat. Malam.